हेलो एवरीवन वेलकम टू गेट एकेडमी ग्लोबल Now we will discuss about eccentrically loaded threaded joints. Okay, so basically eccentrically loaded bolted joint or screw joints will be there. There will be different bolts or screw given in your question. There will be a metric thread given in the question, and the specification of those uh, threads will be given. Now the fundamental thing which you have, you should understand that in the gate examination we will always consider that the shank portion is subjected to the shear. Okay, not the core portion. So the calculation of the uh, load carrying capacity or anything in the threaded joints for gate examination will be based on the diameter of shank portion. That is the nominal diameter of the bolts or the screw will be used for calculation. Okay, so must you must understand that we will be using using nominal diameter. Nominal diameter will be used first of all. Second thing. A metric thread is given like this that M12 into 1.25. So this is the nominal diameter. Okay, this is the nominal diameter which will be used for solving the problem. Okay, now in majority of cases the norm, uh, the diameter is to be calculated. That means the uh, the size of rivet has to be specified after calculation. Okay, and the result which you will obtain will be for the nominal diameter only. Okay, so assume this thing that for the gate examination we will be calculating the nominal diameter. Also, we will be having the value of diameter that is nominal diameter in the question. Okay, so unless it is properly mentioned that calculate the core diameter and core diameter is given as uh, 0.8 times of the nominal diameter. Until then, don't uh, use the core diameter for your calculations. Okay. Now let us start with the centrally loaded joints. So the centrally loaded joints means the line of action of the external load will not pass through the centroid. There will be a there will be an eccentricity between the centroid of the connection and the external load. Now the centrally loaded joints can be categorized into three categories. First, okay, the external load. In first case, the external load will be in plane of joint. Okay, in plane of joints. So let us see the diagram. For example, so if we have a threaded connection like this, okay, like this, then this is the bracket. This is the external load. So this is let us say x y plane. Okay, so this is a wide road, and assume that this is x y plane. Then the load, the external load, and the rivets, both of the things are in x y plane only. So the rivet as well as the load is in same plane. So here we have the centroid of the rivet. This is G, that is the center of the rivet. So the centroidal plane and the load and the plane of the load is same. Centroidal plane, centroidal plane, and plane carrying the load. The load is same. Okay, this is the first category. I'll I'll be discussing the various aspect of this type of loading. Now, in second type of eccentric loading, okay, the plane carrying the load will be parallel to the centroidal plane. Okay, so this may look like this. That is eccentric. The load, the load. Will in a plane parallel to plane of plane of joint. Parallel to the plane of joint. Okay. So here we have the bolted connection like this. Okay. This will be the bracket. This will be the base plate. This will be the base plate. This will be the wall. Like this, here we'll be having threads. Like this, these are the bolts, or you can say the screws. Okay, there will be different number of rows of the bolts. Okay, so this is the bolt. Now, here, this is the plane of the uh, bolts, or you can say plane of the screw, and here is the load. So the plane which carries the load is parallel to the plane which carries 
the uh, these threads okay now here if this if the, if this is the centroid of the arrangement okay then definitely we will assume that the line of action of load line of action of load and and the <coughs> centroidal axis are perpendicular to each other so this is the centroidal axis okay this is the centroidal axis centroidal axis perpendicular 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 to plane of bolts okay the bolts or you can say screw okay and this is the line of action of load this is the line of action of load okay and both are exactly perpendicular to each other okay they are perpendicular to each other okay so this is the second type of eccentric loading okay so you can also call it load perpendicular perpendicular to axis that is centroidal axis sorry centroidal axis centroidal axis of joint okay in third case in third case you may have a condition okay this is the base plate okay of the bracket and here here this is the centroid let us say this is the centroid of the connection of the bolted connection okay this is the centroid okay this is the centroid of the bolted connection this is g okay and here is the line of action of load here is the line of action of load so this is the line of action of load okay this is the load okay so this will be the centroidal axis and this will be and this will be the line of action of load and both will be parallel to each other okay both will be parallel to each other okay so here here this is the centricity in this case in this case this is the centricity okay and in this case that is that's in that is in first case this is the centricity now due to these three orientation different types of stresses will be there in these three condition okay so let us start one by one so starting with the first case okay so in the first case as you can see that the load is in the plane of the centroidal axis okay so this will this situation can be reduced like this if this is the threads okay that means uh, collectively i am calling the uh, bolt and uh, rivet uh, for the sorry for the bolt and screw i am collectively using a term like threads okay so these are the threads okay so this force can be resolved into a force and a moment of force okay so this will be acting at the centroid after dissolving it into a force and a moment of the force so this will be p and here we will be having a moment p is equal to sorry m equal to p into e okay so this will be causing this load acting at the centroid as you can see this will be causing a direct shear force okay direct shear of the bolts okay and to resist this external moment p into e the bolts will be producing resisting force that will be nothing but a shear force okay so that the effect of external moment can be encountered so they will be producing a resisting moment as you can see that external moment is clockwise in nature so the resisting moment should be anti clockwise in nature so here will be having here we will be having the secondary shear force okay so in this situation that is external load which uh, which uh, which will be acting at the plane of joint will be having primary shear forces and secondary shear forces so here only one type of stress is present that is shear stress so the failure will occur due to the shearing of the bolts okay so here this is the secondary shear forces okay this is secondary shear force okay let us say this is p1 dash this is this is p2 dash this is this is p2 dash okay this is 1 2 3 4 this is p3 dash this is p4 dash so the secondary shear force is p1 dash 
P1 double dash, P2 double dash, P3 double dash and P4 double dash. So here in this situation only shear stress will be there, okay, only shear stress is there, shear stress is present in cross section, in cross section of bolt, okay. And uh, basically, we will be assuming that the st stress that is a shear stress should be carried by the shank portion that is the unthreaded portion, hence we will be using the nominal diameter for the calculation, okay. And also it is possible that the, uh, the, the shear area under shear will be the core area, but for gate examination we will be considering that the area which is carrying the shear force is the area of shank which is based on the nominal diameter, okay. So the cross section area of the bolt will be pi by 4 d square okay that d is the nominal diameter or the major diameter of the bolt okay and the shear stress will be having two categories that is the primary shear stress and second shear stress okay and we can find out the resultant shear stress as well how can we find out the resultant shear stress as the primary shear force will be leading to a primary shear stress and the secondary shear force will be leading to a secondary shear stress now if you find out the resultant of these two forces then we'll be having a force that will find that will be causing the final shear stress okay so the resultant of these two force will fall will uh, will give you the shear stress so first for the calculation we'll be for we'll be solving the problem by calculating the resultant resultant of primary and secondary shear force okay so if p dash means primary shear force and p double dash means secondary shear force okay and the angle between them is theta theta is angle between p dash and p double dash so the resultant can be written as p dash is square plus p double dash is square plus 2 p dash p double dash cos theta okay this was this will be the relationship through which we can calculate the resultant force okay through which we can calculate the resultant force and hence the tau okay tau that is the shear stress the shear stress or the resultant shear stress resultant shear stress okay will be equal to resultant force divided by the area of the bolt that is pi by 4 d square okay now so this is a fundamental thing which will uh, which will be discussed in detail after this lecture okay so here from this discussion it is clear that the component is subjected to a direct a shear force only that is resultant shear force and this resultant shear force if i talk if i talk uh, about the resultant shear force we will be giving you a direct shear there is no torsional shear okay so this sh resultant shear force if this is the resultant let us say if this is the resultant number 2 okay if this is the resultant number 3 if this is the resultant number 4 this is resultant number 1 okay so the resultant force will be giving you the uh, resultant shear stress and the nature of that part time of shear stress will be a direct shear so this resultant force this resultant force note it down the resultant this resultant shear force will give you will give a direct direct shear stress direct shear stress now if you want to draw the stress distribution in a single rivet so as this is a rivet okay and this is subjected to a resultant shear force so the stress that is direct shear stress will Okay, so this will be the direct shear stress. So tau will be equal to R by A. Okay, A is the area of the A is the area of the bolt based on the major diameter that is pi by 4 d square. Okay, pi by 4 d square. Now in second category, so it is very clear that here if the load is acting in the plane of bolt with an eccentricity E, then there will be only shear stress in the in the bolt okay or the screw now in second case the load will be in a plane parallel to the plane of joint now what will happen in this case let me draw a separate diagram okay for this okay so i am just 
clearing the board for the discussion of second type of loading. Okay. Now here you can see that if a load is being applied and if you talk about the effect of the load, so let us consider this is the lower edge, this is the lower edge, lower edge of bracket, this is the lower edge of the bracket. Now due to the external load, due to the external load, the bracket will tilt about the lower edge, okay, bracket will tilt about the lower edge, okay. Now as soon as the bracket begins to tilt due to the external load, you can see that the bolt will try to try to resist this, this tilting. Okay. In this diagram, the tilting is there okay, and, and it is been drawn in very exaggerated manner. Okay. In actual practice, as I have told earlier, that in actual practice, this tilting will be stopped by the bolts. Okay. So bolt will create a moment so that, so that the moment which is causing the tilt of bracket will be encountered. Okay. So basically this load will try to tilt the bracket, but it will not be able to tilt the bracket properly. There may be a very slight tilting, but it will not be able to tilt the uh, bracket because there will be a resisting force which will be resisting the bracket in, uh, for tilting. Okay. And hence the bracket will not be able to tilt by any angle and due to this as the bolts are resisting the tilting, they will be subjected to some force. So there will be force induced, there will be some resisting force induced in order to resist the tilting of the bracket. Okay. And from this diagram, we can discuss that what kind of stresses will be induced. So here you can see that due to the tilting of the bracket about the lower edge, about the lower edge, the bolts will feel extension. Here is the bolt number one. Here is the bolt number 1 and here is the bolt number 2. So both the bolts are feeling extension that is a stretching, okay, they are feeling stretching. That means what if I ask you what type of stresses will induce, so first of all you can see that due to this tilting a tensile stress will induce in the bolts, okay. So the first stress is the tensile stress, so tensile stress will induce tensile stress will be there in bolts okay and also as this load is eccentric to the rivets okay sorry to the bolts and if you want to if you want to replace this load uh, with a load and the moment of the load okay so you can replace it like this this is the this is the bolt okay this is the bolt this is the bolt number 2 okay this is the centroid this is the centroid of the arrangement so here we can transfer the external load p okay and here will be the load due to the eccentricity here will be the moment due to eccentricity that is m will be equal to p into e so this will be causing the tensile stress this will cause tensile stress in bolt or screw okay and this will cause a primary or as there is no secondary shear stress because this, uh, the second stress is the tensile stress so there will be direct shear stress and tensile stress you can call it direct shear force this is direct shear force and it will cause direct shear okay direct shear so in this type of loading the bolts will be subjected to direct shear direct shear plus tensile stress okay so that shear stress will be there and a tensile stress will be there in such type of loading okay and we will discuss the various aspect of this type of loading in next lecture now in third type of loading in third type of loading okay in which the load was parallel to the centroidal axis but perpendicular to the plane of bolt so here was the load Okay, here we had the value of, uh, here we had the centroid, okay, here we have the bolt, let us say this is the bolt, okay, this is the axis of bolt, okay. Now, here is the line of action of the bolt, here is the centroidal axis, so this is, this was the centricity. Now, we will replace the load through the load and the moment of load, okay, so here we can replace the load, okay, so I, I will replace the load, okay, so this will be 
a load acting at the centroid and the moment due to the eccentricity. So, this is the moment. Okay. Now, again due to this moment, again two things will happen. As you can see, this load is acting parallel to the axis of bolt. This load is parallel to axis of bolt, parallel to axis of bolts. Okay. This is parallel to the axis of bolts. Hence, it will subject the bolts in tension. So, due to this load, the bolt will be subjected to tension. So, a tensile stress will be there. So, first thing which I have understand that there will be a tensile stress, tensile stress. Okay. Now, as the load was, was here and due to this load, we are, we are having a moment about the centroidal axis. Okay. And this bracket is attached to a wall and this is the lower edge of the bracket. Okay. So, due to this external load, the bracket will try to tilt about the lower edge. Okay. And this thing will be similar to the previous ones as due to the tilting of the load, there will be another tensile stress. So, there will be tensile stress okay, due to due to load, okay, due to load and second there will be another tensile stress, tensile stress to prevent to prevent tilting of bracket. Okay, so, these two types of stresses will be there. So, if you talk about the resultant, okay, if you talk about the resultant, so, resu so resultant will also be a tensile stress. So, a resultant stress will be there, resultant stress will be there and this resultant, resultant stress, this resultant stress will also be a tensile stress, tensile stress. So, from this lecture, we understand that in different type of eccentric loading, there will be different types of stresses. Okay? So, the calculations should be performed accordingly. So, in this type of loading, where the load and the, the, uh, the plane carrying the load and the plane carrying the joints are identical, that means the plane is in plane of the joint, the load is in plane of the joint. In that case, the shear will be the cause of failure. The, the analysis will be based on fi finding the resultant shear stress. Here, here in this case, where the line of action of the load and the central axis are perpendicular to each other. That means, the load is in a plane parallel to the plane of joint. So, in that case, the load, the sorry, the bolts will be subjected to two types of stresses that is a shear stress and a tensile stress. And in this types of loading where the line of action of load is parallel, but eccentric with the centroidal axis. So, in that case, the resultant stress will be a tensile stress. Okay? So, from next lecture, we will discuss about different types of eccentric loading. In detail, I will be discussing the, what will be the formula, what will be the design criteria. Thank you.